Friday family pizza day, all the while she's coming in, which is fantastic. Um, I'm also excited to introduce them. Yeah, Dolly. Okay, okay. Um, I didn't have her last presentation. That's okay. So, yeah. uh, Christina Dolan, she's a primatologist who works with captive gorillas, chimpanzees, and macaques at the Chicago's Lincoln Park Zoo, um, which is a uh, one of the zoos is in the forefront of um, scientific research. She studies the welfare and social complexities and personalities of primates in captive environments. She also conducts field work in Costa Rica on mantle power monkeys, which is the loudest animal on the planet. Make your guts now while you've got the information. Uh, and is interested in the social dynamics of wild New World monkey populations in fragmented forests. Christina has a BFA from Columbia College in Chicago with a postdoc work in biology from Northwest University. So, Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super happy to be here. This is my first time in Montana, so it's beautiful. Um, very different from Chicago. So as Stella mentioned, you might have heard, I actually have a BFA, which means I studied um, fine art. And I did some biology coursework, but I'm going to go over my career a little bit um, so that I can clear that up for you. And you're probably wondering why I did art, and now I'm studying primates. But um, this work that I'm going to talk about today took place in Costa Rica with Dr. Laura Bolt, who's at the University of Toronto in the Anthropology Department. Um, so as I said, first I'm going to talk a little bit about my career uh, tra trajectory and the primate order background um, after that, just in case there's not um, a lot of knowledge about primates in general. And then I'm going to go into the field site that I did this research at, um, the research itself, results and analysis, and then at the end I'm going to talk a little bit about Lincoln Park Zoo, where I work currently. So that's me um, giving this talk at Northwestern University, where I just did some coursework in biology for the past two years. But um, my 20s were full of a lot of different things, um, different career paths, like metal smithing. So I went to school for art. And I studied metal smithing, so this is something I've made in the past. Um, I was a teacher, so I was an art teacher for pre-K kids. I was a nanny. I got my nail tech license and did nail art. <laughs> um, and then I decided I wanted to be a scientist. So <laughs> basically, with this slide, what I'm trying to tell you is that there's not one clear path to um, being a scientist or studying biology or studying animals, whatever you want to do. Um, I know you're all undergrad bio majors, correct? Yeah, so, so you don't have to have it all figured out um, because I figured it out pretty late in life. So yeah, so I did all these things, um, but I always wanted to work with animals. I just didn't figure out how, and I decided to go back to school. So I worked at Northwestern University in Chicago, um, and while working there, I went to school at night. and. I still wasn't working with animals. I was just studying biology. So I decided to figure out how I could go study animals in their own environment. Um, and I was looking up how to get experience in field work. And I found this place in Costa Rica that's called Madeiras Rainforest Conservancy. And they have field opportunities where you can go work with a professor who teaches courses there and teaches you how to do field work um, and helps you with a project. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But if you guys are at all interested in that, you can definitely talk to me afterwards. Um, so I decided to go to Costa Rica and do work on primates. So I'm going to give a little background on primates in general. Um, I'm not going too in depth, but just so we're all on sort of the same page when I start talking about the research I did. So primates are distributed pretty much all throughout the tropics in the world. Um, and so the green on this map represents the old world monkeys who live in um, Africa and Asia. And the red represents new world monkeys. And they were coined new world monkeys because they came over into the Americas, into the new world um, through what scientists think was a land raft about 40 million years ago. But you can see primates are all over. They are the most, third most diverse um, order of mammals after rodents and bats. So that's a cool fact. But, um, and then some of them, so they are all pretty much, pretty much tropical, but some live 
you can see up in the right corner um, in Japan, and I don't know if you've seen pictures of these snow monkeys that are in um, hot springs in Japan, and I'll talk more about them later because we have them at the zoo and we do research on them, but, um, but they are the exception to the tropical monkey or primate rule. Um, but primates are super diverse, as I said, and so here's the smallest primate in the world, a mouse lemur, and here's the largest, a uh, gorilla. Um, and then there's a picture of the snow monkeys that people have probably seen in their hot springs. And so that's actually thought of as a cultural adaptation, which is pretty cool. So our snow monkeys at the zoo don't do this when we give them their hot tub that they can go in. But, um, and we're all primates. So when we study primates, we are also able to compare to humans and learn more about ourselves, which I think is pretty cool. So you can see humans here, but this is, um, all primates, and basically we all have the a same primate ancestor that's from about 50 million years ago. Um, but I was talking a little bit about New World monkeys and Old World monkeys and how they separated. And I wanted to show this here that New World monkeys separated from the rest of primates that are going to keep evolving in the Old World, and they went to the New World to evolve in a different way. So these platyrines, which are the New World monkeys, and catarines, which are everything else on this right side, um, evolved very differently because there are different ecological niches that they started to live in. And so here's a illustration, New World monkeys, which are the ones in the Americas and the ones that I studied in my field work, they have a flat nose with a wider septum. Um, and Old World monkeys, which we are, they have a smaller nose and it's, they're named for their hooked nose. So some other differences, um, New World monkeys mostly live in trees <clears throat> and Old World monkeys can live in trees but are also terrestrial. Um, and so when, and you guys might already know this, but when you're looking at the tails of these two types of primates, um, the New World monkeys are the only ones with a prehensile tail so they can use it for swinging and they use it basically like a fifth limb. Um, old world monkeys, these are baboons. They have tails, but they can't use them in this way. And so this is a good example of how um, animals evolved to their ecology and the ecological niche that they are in because these new world monkeys have tropical rainforests with vines and lots of trees and they live in different levels of the canopy. Um, but in old world monkeys, you have some on the ground and they have savannas and they don't necessarily live in trees where they'd be hanging from their tail. Uh, but overall, almost all primates have large social groups. They're very social animals um, and those are influenced by distribution of resources and uh, predation. There are some that are not social at all, but it's very few and far between. Um, almost all primates have a linear hierarchy with either an alpha male or an alpha female or both. Um, and they are usually non-monogamous. There's a few exceptions uh, that form monogamous pairs. But that's also one of my favorite primates, a tarsier, which you guys may know. <laughs> okay, so um, that's just the primate background, a little precursor to the research. Um, so I went to Costa Rica <coughs> to conduct this research and I went to northeastern Costa Rica to a field station called La Suerte. This is actually the Rio La Suerte that runs through it. And these are some pictures. Um, it's sort of hard to see in here, but this is the field site, so that's where I slept, and it's actually pretty like lush compared to other field sites, and other primatologists have, you're usually camping, but this was pretty nice. Um, there were showers, and so that's great. So, this, can't, this site is in between two forest fragments that the um, Conservancy owns. And basically, I just a little background on deforestation in Costa Rica um, so that we can talk about forest fragments is that Costa Rica was heavily deforested in the 70s and 80s because um, cattle farmers went there to raise cattle and then send meat back to places like Burger King and Wendy's. But approximately 80% of the forest um, of Costa Rica have disappeared since that started. But now people are reforesting the land. And so 
Um, now half of Costa Rica's existing forest is under protection of their government. And La Suerte was originally a cattle farm that was reforested by the owner's father. Um, and now it functions as a research and teaching facility since 1993. And so these are the two forest fragments. And one says big forest, one says small forest, but that's where it's located in Costa Rica. And the big forest is not that big. It's about three square kilometers. Um, but it's been completely reforested within 30 years. So it's pretty cool to be able to see that, that these tropical forests can actually bounce back pretty fast. And they're very biodiverse. Um, so these are just some of the species that live there. And I didn't get to see a tapir or a jaguar, but they're there, um, and lots of bats and birds. But so in terms of monkeys, there's three species that live in these forests. And there's the white-faced capuchin, the spider monkey, and the mantled howler monkey. And so howler monkeys have the Alawada palliata um, species. They have nine species that compose this genus. And mantled howler monkeys are one of them. And I decided to do my research on them. And I think they're interesting. A lot of people don't because they are <laughs> very slow and sort of boring. Um, but the reason they're slow is because they actually, so they eat leaves that other animals in their ecosystem cannot digest. So they actually, they have to rest to be able to digest these leaves. Um, so they do sleep a lot of the day. But, so they are the loudest land mammal. They're not the loudest animal in the world because that's a sperm whale, but they're definitely the loudest land mammal. Um, and you can hear them for up to three miles, and that's because they have this enlarged hyoid bone in their throat, so they can make these like echoing, loud barking noises. Um, and they're the most proliferous of all New World monkeys, so they eat these leaves that other monkeys in the forest don't eat. And so I do have a video that I took of them howling, and I want to make sure it plays with sound, but I've done this talk before where people have said, Oh, you talk about how loud they are, and then you don't show a video. So I wanted to show a video this time um, so that people can hear it. So that's not working. Yeah, that'd be great. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I messed it all up. Okay, so it's working. When this unfreezes, we'll be able to see. Yes, yeah, so it's mostly for the sound. The video is just of trees, but so this is not at full um, sound capacity, but when they're all together howling, it's the loudest. So this was just one male doing this. But um, 
they'll howl usually in the mornings and at night to let other groups know where they are. And this helps um, avoid confrontation between groups. So that's why scientists think that that has evolved, the calling system. So now let's see. Hmm. So now I'm having more technical difficulties with this screen and this screen, but let's see. What'd you say? Okay, great. Okay, so that was the video. Um, so anyway, when they are howling all together, it is um, much louder. I might turn some of these lights on again. It's okay, we're gonna go with it. Now we're in the dark. <laughs> but so, okay. So what is ethology? There's a definition here, but um, ethology is the study of animal behavior, but more importantly, um, studying animal behavior in a, their natural environment can give you a lot of clues as to why that behavior has evolved in that certain way, as opposed to studying it in captivity, which is now what I do. Um, but viewing behavior as an adaptive trait is something that's really important for understanding why animals be behave in a certain manner. And so when you are starting a project like this, you have to look at past research to know what these animals have been doing in the past and how they've been behaving before that will help inform your questions. So research on mantled howler monkeys goes back to 1955, which isn't really that long ago. Um, and a lot of the research just has to do with their activity budgets every day. So how much they're eating, how much they're sleeping, and where they're traveling. But I wanted to look at factors that influence social decision making within these groups. So who do they spend their time around within their groups, and why do they make those choices? So some factors that I thought would contribute to the social decision making are um, their dispersal patterns, their primary bonds between individuals in the group, and um, evolutionary pressures and ecological pressures like the fragmented forest that I spoke about that they live in, and um, infanticidal behavior. I'm gonna go into more detail with these. So dispersal means that one or both sexes disperses from the group that they are born into, and this happens in all primates, um, and this prevents inbreeding, so basically you know that you're not if you're leaving, then you're not breeding with your father or your brother. Um, and the philopatric sex stays in their natal group and lives with their family. So you can either have males stay or females stay and then the other sex leaves, or you can have both sex leave um, and that would be bisexual dispersal, which is what the mantled howler monkeys partake in. And so what, does anyone know why this would be important for social dynamics or any ideas? <laughs> you guys don't have to say anything, but I <laughs> just want to see if anyone has any thoughts. Um, well, it's important for the reason that I said sort of before is that if you're with your family, you might be making different decisions than you would if you're not with your family in terms of who you want to hang out with or who helps you take care of your children or things like that. And at La Suerte, with these three species that are there, um, the mantle howler monkeys are the only ones who partake in bisexual dispersal, and so I thought that would be interesting to look at their social dynamics with this dispersal pattern. And so primary bonds is something that comes from the dispersal patterns, and basically if you're assuming that these animals disperse from their birth groups and form new groups where they're unrelated, um, usually the primary bonds in those groups are between unrelated males and unrelated females for purposes of copulation and breeding. And if they don't have any family around, they most likely won't be hanging out with other females who they're related to or other males that they're related to. So um, this is what happens in howler monkey groups is that usually females and males have the strongest bonds and females and other females show the most aggression with one another. And um, they are the largest group of the Alawada genus, so I thought that was interesting. Um, every other 
species in the Alouatta genus, which is the howler monkey genus, they have smaller groups of like nine to 12 individuals, but these mantle howler monkeys have very large groups and there is a linear hierarchy. So there's an alpha male and mating usually only occurs with that alpha male. Um, but the ratio is <clears throat> a one to four male to female ratio and <clears throat> a one to three ratio between females with infants and females without infants. So that's important for thinking about group composition, how many males to females there are, and things like that. Um, another pressure that I wanted to look at was infanticide. So this is the killing of an infant in a group that you are not part of yet. So basically, if a male is immigrating from his group and wants to incorporate himself into a new family group, um, he might come in and try to kill all the babies and then have his own babies with these females. And this does a few things. Um, it shows that he's strong and can take over the alpha male that's already there. Um, and it also creates the a resource of ovulating females because when the females stop feeding their children, then they go back into ovulation. So this way, all the other babies are dead. He can <laughs> basically sire his own offspring. The females are ovulating again, so it's great for him. Um, so with all of these things in mind, my research question was, I wanted to see who females with infants spent their time around because you have all these different things contributing to social dynamics and if their infant is a variable that is something that could change the social dynamics of their group and if they have the pressure of infanticide but they also have females who show aggression, then I wanted to see how this made their group composition different or the same as before. Um, and actually not a lot of research has been done on this in the past. So <clears throat> I only read one thing about any holler monkeys um, doing anything differently, which I'll get to later. But basically, I thought this was interesting. Um, and so my hypothesis was that their social dynamics wouldn't change much. The females would still stay near the males more often than not. Um, the males would be <clears throat> their main protection if another male came in and wanted to kill their babies. Um, and the alpha male, if he most likely sired that offspring, then he could hopefully pro provide some parental care. But yeah, I basically just thought it wouldn't change. So that was my hypothesis. Um, so then I had to start collecting data. And this is a very preliminary study because um, I only collected 23 hours of data over six days. However, I am going back next summer um, to do this. But the way that I collected data was something called interval sampling. <clears throat> and there's different names for this type of sampling. But you pick a focal animal. So I would find a group of monkeys and then pick um, an adult female. And I would set my watch for 30 minutes. And every two minutes, it would beep. And on that two minute mark, I would write down what she was doing and who was her nearest neighbor. So nearest neighbor meant um, any animal in her group that's within five meters of her. And if they were within five meters of her, then I would record the distance. And you're basically eyeballing it because you can't measure them out there. But, um, but so I would record if there was another adult female within a meter of her or touching her. Um, so another thing I want to say is that when you are doing this and you're recording the activity of an animal, you have what's called an ethogram. And that's a predetermined uh, list of behaviors for that specific animal that you're studying, or species. So I did have an ethogram with behaviors, but that wasn't incorporated into this study because I just wanted to see who they were spending their time with. Um, and so I looked at three sex classes. So adult males, adult females without infants, and adult females with infants. So the females with infants, this infant had to be I wanted it to be a very dependent infant, so I made sure that the infant was clinging to mom at least two-thirds of the sample and within five meters of mom the entire sample. So they're not a juvenile or they're not going off on their own. They're a very dependent infant, which would be susceptible to being killed. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the results. Um, 
So this is a graph of the nearest neighbor sex class activity budget. So adult females with infants are the sex class in purple, adult females without infants are in pink, and adult males are in blue. But basically what I found was that females with infants were spending significantly more time than expected for the composition of the group with other females with infants. They were spending what was expected with other females without infants, um, and less time than we expected with adult males. Then if you look at females without infants, they were spending more time than was expected with adult males, and less time than was expected with females with infants. So basically the females without infants were around males all the time, like we thought they would be, and like it has said in past research, um, females without infants decreased their time around males when they had an infant with them. And they increased their time around females with infants. But so what I thought was cooler is that females without infants, when they were around females with infants, this is distance in meters, they were significantly closer to the females with infants than the other sex classes. So, and basically what I saw was, even though these females without infants maybe spent less time with them, when they were with the females with infants, they were very close, and they were helping with the babies. Um, and females with infants were significantly close to females with infants as well. So all of this, what does this mean? <laughs> um, and what I think it could show, and again, this is 23 hours of data, so not a lot, is uh, what is referred to as alloparenting. And so alloparenting means that you are caring for an offspring that is not a direct descendant of you. So this doesn't exclude siblings or uh, grandchildren. That's still a direct, uh, related to you in a way where that could be what's called kin selection. And so alloparenting will happen a lot within kin selection theory, which means that you would want to care for an individual that is genetically related to you in some way, because that means your genes will go on to future generations, even if that individual is your grandchild or um, your sibling. It would be good for you to help care for them so that they can go on and your genes will go on. But in these groups, we're assuming that these individuals aren't related because of the bisexual dispersal. Um, so when, it's, when this happens with non-kin, it's thought of as more of an altruistic act. Um, so this female with an infant is with another female with an infant. She might care for that infant while the mom, say, goes and forages for food and then comes back with the mindset of, oh, well, she might do this for me in the future and I can go forage for food when I need to without my baby, or things like that, when they get older. Um, and this is seen in other really social animals. Um, I put a picture of humans here because we do it too. When women have babies, um, you know, they might not necessarily want to stay all the time with the man whose baby it is, because maybe he's not the best at caring for that baby all the time. <laughs> um, maybe she would want to go to other women who have parental experience and they can help care for her baby and she can get more things done, like errands or things like that. So we do this too. Uh, some of the benefits of it are you can wean more rapidly. So if you're going and foraging and getting a lot of nutrients, then you can wean your babies um, and then they can be independent sooner. You can increase your milk synthesis by foraging more and getting more food. Um, but there's also a lot of social learning opportunities. So if your baby is around other females and other babies, they can learn how to interact in that social group. Um, one thing, though, that I think is interesting about the fragmented forest, um, which is why I put that in the beginning as like an ecological pressure, is that so I was in a forest of three square kilometers. So when these animals disperse from their natal group, they might be going to groups where there are related individuals if they're not leaving that forest fragment <coughs> at some point. Um, so 
this could be part of kin selection. They could somehow be related. It might not be completely unrelated groups in these forests. Um, and so sometimes alloparenting is seen in really um, stable environments, and sometimes it's seen in really unpredictable environments. So I think looking more at the environment they're in is something that needs to be done in the future. And so that's what I hope to do when I go back next summer. Um, but yeah, so that's basically that research. So from this point on, I'm gonna talk about the stuff I do at the zoo. So I sort of wanted to stop and take questions about this, if anyone has any, and then move on to the zoo stuff, because that's completely different. So if anyone has questions now, feel free. What about yes. the that's a good question. I have never heard of that. Yeah, I've only heard of males doing it. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I noticed in chimp males, they will also eat the babies. That's an interesting fact. <laughs> but yeah, so you can ask more questions at the end, but now I'm gonna go on to talk about Lincoln Park Zoo. Has anyone been to Lincoln Park Zoo? Hey, you have, yeah. We live there, yeah. <laughs> um, so I actually lived on the street from the zoo, so it's pretty nice, nice commute to work. Um, so, but within the zoo, which is in the center of <coughs> Chicago, it's really like, you can see downtown from the zoo, um, there is a center called the Lester E. Fisher Center for the Study and Conservation of African Apes. And that is where I work. I'm the research coordinator there. And we do a lot of cool things. And we study mostly African apes, which are chimpanzees here. You can see in the bottom two pictures. This is Zachary. He's my favorite chimpanzee. I can tell you guys, because he's not going to hear it from you, um, that he's my favorite. And no one else is. <coughs> But we also have gorillas, and this is one of our bachelor gorillas, Mosey, and he's about 13 years old. Um, so he's in our bachelor group of gorillas, which are all teenage males, more or less. Um, but we also have Japanese macaques, who are the snow monkeys I talked about. Um, and we study a lot of different things with these different apes. We study their cognition and their learning abilities. We study their welfare in captivity. We study their welfare in the wild, and we compare their behavior in the wild to captivity, which I'll talk more about in a second. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna first talk about our cognition studies. So we have touch screens for um, the apes at the zoo, and we do not force them to partake in these studies, um, but we, there's mesh and their exhibit is on the other side and we push the screen up and this is Quan on top. He's our silverback male in our family group and he has been doing the cognition studies for a long time um, and he really likes doing them because when they do these puzzles, they get, if they get it correct, they get a preferred treat that they really like and for Quan, it's a tomato. Um, and there's a Japanese macaque at the bottom doing it, and they really like peanuts, so uh, if they get this task correct, they'll get a peanut, but it's really um, engaging for them to use their mind in this way because they like figuring out puzzles. In the wild, they have these puzzles that they have to try to figure out, um, and in captivity, we try to give them as much enrichment as possible, but um, I think these puzzles also help enrich their day in their lives. But so some of the studies that we do are sequencing. Um, so the macaque at the bottom has a blue dot, but there would be a blue dot and then say a red dot. And if he, the right sequence is blue and then red, he gets a treat. Um, and then he'll learn that that's the right sequence and then we can add a yellow dot and they're all over the screen. And so we'll see if he keeps doing blue, red, yellow, or if he gets confused if we add maybe six dots. Um, so that's one of the tests we do. We also do tests that ask them if they can identify the odd shape or odd item out. So if you have like five squares and a circle, if they can identify that that circle is the different item, uh, then they get their treat. We also have match to sample. So the macaques, they'll see a flower. They'll see a blue flower and then that goes away. And then a screen comes up where there's a blue flower and a red flower. 
and they have to remember that the blue flower is what they just saw and touch the blue flower. Um, so I have a video of one of our gorillas named Patty when she was very small participating in a touch screen task. Um, and you can see that, so this is their environment. They can just go up to the mesh and partake in it if they want to, but we never force them to do it. And so I don't, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> I have a lot of videos on here, I'm sorry. But let's see. So we can just play it on here. And so she is doing the sequencing task. So she has to hit the 0 and then the x. And then she gets a little reward. <laughs> and she is now seven, and this is when she's about like two. Um, but she's very intelligent, and she is one of the youngest gorillas to do this in the world. And that's her mom sitting next to her. And so the keepers are on the other side of the mesh. We never go in with them, um, but we do interact with them from the other side of the mesh. So that's Patty doing her task. Um, so we also study their welfare. And so <clears throat> this is a picture of termite fishing. And chimpanzees do this in the wild. They'll find a termite mound and then create different tools, which Jane Goodall was the first person to figure out that chimps use tools in her studies. But, um, They'll use a myriad of different tools and fish for termites. And so in their exhibits at the zoo, we give them these man-made termite mounds, but we put different things in there for them. We can't use termites, but we'll put ketchup or jam or peanut butter in them. And so they get to engage in their behavior that they would be doing in the wild in captivity. Um, on the bottom, that's his name's Optimus Prime, <laughs> um, but he's one of our chips. And so he pulled all his nesting materials together and made a little bed for himself. And they have nesting materials to do this. And in the wild, they would grab all these materials and make a nest in trees. So we give them that opportunity as well. Um, I have another video of, this is Hank. So Hank is the um, alpha male in the chimp group. And he is doing some extractive foraging. So there's a little crate up against the mesh and it has a bunch of food in it that he wants and he has to try to get it out. And so this will keep him busy and engaged for sometimes a very long period of time, sometimes it's short depending on uh, the device that we're using. Sometimes we give them little PVC tubes with jello and that takes them like all day. <laughs> um, but he's pretty good at it. He's been at the zoo for a while. And so we do all of that. But another thing we do to collect data on these animals is we have an app called the Zoo Monitor app. And um, this is what I train people to use who come and intern for us at the Fisher Center. <clears throat> but you get an iPad, and you have this app, and you can pick your focal animal, like I talked about before, that I did in the wild. You pick an animal, and every two minutes or every minute, 30 seconds sometimes, the iPad will beep, and then you put down what they're doing in that moment, their behavior, from the ethogram that is predetermined that we created. And then we have a map, and you can put down where they are in their environment. And this data, we have data like this back to like 2002 on the apes that have been at the Fisher Center and at the zoo. So we have a lot of data on apes in captivity and how they behave and where they like to go and who they like to hang out with in their groups. Um, <clears throat> and so we can use this to determine if they are showing that they have really good welfare or negative welfare, if they're stressed out. Maybe someone is spending all of their time alone in a corner and they're not engaging in any of the behaviors that we give them. They're not going to the termite mound, they're not doing anything then we can analyze that and see that they are unhappy and figure out why and try to enrich their lives. Oh, this is a snow monkey again. So what I'm working on right now at the zoo is looking at macaques and how much they're wounding one another 
and seeing what the wounding rates correlate with. So if there's anything within their social dynamics or we have a personality survey that we gave out to a bunch of different zoos. Um, so we are basically surveying macaques across zoos but also at our zoo with our data. Seeing if there's any correlation between their social network or their personality and how much wounding happens in their groups. So, um, so this can help inform when you're creating new groups in captivity how you should create these groups and how you can prevent wounding in species like macaques who are naturally pretty aggressive, but how we can lower those rates. And then we also do, um, we have a project in Africa called the Gua Logo Triangle Ape Project. And we have a scientist who goes to Africa and studies the chimpanzees and gorillas there in a place called the Gua Logo Triangle, which is in the Republic of Congo. And um, they set up camera traps so that people don't have to be there and invading their uh, territory. But we have a ton of camera trap footage that shows how they use their termite mounds in the wild and um, how they're living with the gorillas in this area. And so we can compare that wild data to the captive data. And so that's something that really helps us. And we've been in Google Logo Triangle since 93. So we have a lot of data from that area. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, which is one of my favorite parts of the Fisher Center, is that we have a collaboration with a sanctuary in Louisiana called Chimp Haven. And so chimpanzees were used in biomedical research until 2016 when the NIH banned that because um, of how we were learning how intelligent they are and how human-like they are and how they experience empathy and pain. And um, so now we have all these retired chimpanzees who were used in biomedical research and they basically have nowhere to go. Um, if they lived in a lab, some of them might still be in that lab because there's nowhere for these chimps who didn't grow up like a normal chimp. Um, they don't know how to necessarily be social with other chimpanzees. There's nowhere for them to go. But there is this place called Chimp Haven that was built. Um, and we collaborate with them. And they basically have all previously, well, they're still NAH owned, but these retired chimps who go there and try to live as normal of a life as possible after um, their career as a biomedical chimp. And so we also use the Zoo Monitor app there, and we have data on them, and we can see how they're interacting with one another. Um, and so we partner with them, and we do research on that data, and we see how their groups are working with these chimps who have maybe never been around another chimp, or they were in a cage next to another chimp, but they never got to interact with one another. And we can look at how they're interacting now. Um, and yeah, so that's actually my favorite part because I, I love seeing them run around and they get to maybe, you know, there's videos of them like seeing grass for the first time and being able to go outside for the first time. And it's really cool. Um, and then this is just a fun picture. Two of our gorilla moms had babies this past summer. <laughs> so uh, this is Raleigh and her baby Mandika. And this is Bana and her baby Jekke. And this is when they were first born, but they are now like five and six months old. They're um, an exact month apart from one another. So watching them grow up has been fun so far. Um, but that's it. So if you have any questions. <laughs> So I also brought these. Um, it just talks about the Fisher Center. Um, so we have interns who only collect data on the macaques, and we have interns who only collect data on the gorillas and chimps. Um, and we open up the internship. So we just opened up the APE internship with the chimps and gorillas in the fall, and we took four new interns. And then that won't be open again until the spring. Um, it's pretty competitive, I will say that. So most of the time it's people who have an undergraduate degree and they want to go get a master's. And this is a really good way for them to get um, experience collecting data. And we try to, we can't with everyone, but we try to do independent projects with them. So one of our old interns actually was just first author on a paper that is published, it's going to be published in Zoo Biology. 
Um, so that's super impressive for her. But, but yeah, and then the MacAC interns, we, so usually twice a year, but yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Are any of the eggs from the Columbia Detention Center released after the general? No. Yeah, so we don't do that. Um, they are mostly all captive born. And so whether they were born in our zoo or a different zoo, they were usually born in a zoo um, or a sanctuary and then were moved to our zoo. So they're not releasable. Um, but yeah, we try to care for them as best we can. And I didn't mention this, but we also, so on exhibit where the public can see the apes, there's two gorilla groups they can see and one chimp group. But we have a chimp group in the back that are retired chimps, like at Chimp Haven. Um, but they are not from medical research. They are from being privately owned or um, being in circuses and things like that, entertainment. And so they can't be around the big crowds because they were raised by humans, so they really want to interact with you and it would be too overstimulating for them. Um, but like they're by our desks, and so we get to see them and stuff. But yeah, they're not releasable really either. It's a good question. Anyway, if you have other questions you want to ask me privately, <laughs> feel free. Um, and you can take one of these if you want. I didn't bring a lot of them, but they're up here. But thank you for having me. Really appreciate it.